Okay, so the first obvious question would be uh, what comes to your mind when you think of the word modern or modern? Industry. Industry. Industry, yeah. Technology, yeah. <laughs> okay, what else? Technology. Yeah, technology. So modernity or modernism is a set of ideas that originated in the West okay, and they eventually morphed into political and economic systems okay, which uh, dominate the world today. So the first thing that we do is that we briefly go through, uh, briefly go through the origins of modernity, where did it come from okay. and we go, th we go through how these ideas flew across Europe, across the West and then due to colonization, they spread to all over the world. So the first person here is none other than Gutenberg. He was the one who created the printing press in about 1440. And because of the printing press that he created, knowledge was able to spread across much more easily than compared to previously, compared to before, when you had to manually write the books. So it was much more easier to spread knowledge. And because of the printing press, uh, Europe was able to disseminate knowledge much quicker than anywhere else in the world. It's going to play a huge role in making Europe get rich. And then afterwards, the second guy is Nicholas Copernicus. What did he do? Any idea? Nicholas Copernicus? I, I've already written it. Heliocentrism. So previously, people used to believe that the earth was the center of the universe, okay, or earth was the center of everything. And that was called the geocentric model. That was proposed by the Greeks. I think it was there even before the Greeks, but the oldest manuscripts that we have they are those of the Greeks. And then it was carried on by the Muslims. And then from the Muslims, it transferred to Europe. And Copernicus was the one who said that uh, we should ra rather than placing the earth at the center, we should try and place the sun at the center and do our calculations from there. And Copernicus was heavily influenced by uh, Muslim scientists such as Nasiruddin Atusi and Ibn Shatir. Okay, he was the one who used the models that were made by Nasiruddin Atusi and Ibn Shatir and then he placed the sun in the center. And then he said that this is what I'm going to present, the, that the sun is going to be at the center of the universe, of the solar system at that time. So then after this, after Nicholas Copernicus, came the Copernican Revolution. Okay, so people became more and more interested in astronomy and they began studying it. And then another very important figure that came, anyone knows who this who this person is? Rene Descartes. So what did he do? Cogito. Cogito, but what is Cogito? I think therefore I am. But what is it? It's a philosophy. Yeah, so can you explain a little bit to me what, what it means? So he has a strong concept of tableau ras, which means uh, whatever is on the table, please just remove please everything on the table yeah, yeah. and start from scratch. Yes, excellent. So René Descartes was the person who introduced skepticism and rationalism. Okay. And skepticism means that you doubt. Okay. Skepticism quite literally means doubt. Mm -hmm. So at that time in the West, Aristotelian thought dominated the West. Okay, All throughout the West the and also throughout the Muslim world as well. The models that were presented by the Greeks were very dominant for 1,500 years. So what René Descartes did was that he introduced skepticism in the sense that he said that I'm going to go through an experience. So when he, when he was writing his book on meditations, so he said that I'm going to go through an experience which no one else has done before. And then what he did was that he systematically doubted all of the ideas that he had. So let's say he has an idea that this thing is true, so he doubted it. Then he was he was uh, he was not able to make it. I mean, he was not able to decisively prove it. So he said, anything that I'm not able to decisively prove it, I'm going to doubt it. So he doubted first. He doubted his senses. So he said, okay, my senses can lie to me. So if I look at a coin and I look at the star, the coin is appears to me bigger than the star. But in reality, the star is bigger than the coin. So therefore, my senses do not make sense. So my senses can be doubted. So then he was like, he thought about rationality, or whether my rationality, whether my reason 
can be yeah whether whether things that I know of they can be trusted or not. So then he said, who uh, how do I know that I'm not living in a dream? Maybe I'm living in a dream, or maybe some evil demon is deceiving me. Right? So he's making me believe in the things that I believe in right now. So he doubted that as well. And then finally he said that the only thing that I cannot doubt is the only thing that I cannot doubt is is that I'm doubting. Okay? And then he said that because of that he gave his famous phrase Kojito, which he said, right? Kojito ergo sum. I think therefore I am. And that became the basis of modern philosophy. And therefore René Descartes is called the father of modern Western philosophy. And now, once we study René Descartes, segue, once we study René Descartes and we, we study Al-Ghazali as well, we know that Al-Ghazali also went through the same experience and also, uh, and also gave the same reason. So there is a possibility that René Descartes was, was uh, influenced by Ghazali, but of course it is not con it is not concrete, you have no proof, but there is such possibility. So René Descartes did, what he did was, that he demolished all the ideas, all the structures that he had, right, and he started to build something on, something, uh, I mean, started to build the knowledge that he had on something very foundational. That is existence. That is his own existence. And then he said that, let's say, the ideas and the uh, uh, the things that I believe of, I'm going to demolish everything, and then I'm going to construct a new building based upon reason. Okay. So now his philosophy came to be known as rationalism. Okay. Rationalism means that reason over everything. So I'm going to destroy everything that I know of now, and then I'm going to build a new building based upon reason. So René Descartes was very important because he introduced skepticism, that is doubting the things that you know before, and also rationalism, that you are going to build knowledge based upon reason. So René Descartes is also very famous for the Cartesian coordinate system that we have, right? X and Y. So he did a lot of, a lot of things. And then afterwards, after René Descartes, this person is Sir Francis Bacon. Anyone know the Sir, Sir Francis Bacon? Sir Francis Bacon? Huh? You had Bacon? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Sir Francis Bacon is known as the father of father of modern science. Sir Francis Bacon and Galileo, okay, both of them are the fathers of modern science. So Francis Bacon was the, and the father of empiricism as well. So René Descartes said that reason is going to be, reason alone is going to be the one which is going to determine knowledge. And Francis Bacon said that it's going to be the experience that is going to determine knowledge. And what is science? Science is experience. Right? We experience, we observe things, and then afterwards, once we observe things, then we uh, rationalize it. So uh, Francis Bacon said that it's going to be the things that we observe, which is going to be the source of our knowledge. And that became empiricism. And then he created a new discipline, which, was called, which he called it the new science. Okay? And he preferred a method of reasoning which is called the inductive method of reasoning. So, anyone is aware of what inductive method of reasoning is? Anyone knows? So, if A equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C. <laughs> yeah, that is deductive. That is not inductive. Okay, so there are three types of reasoning. First is deductive, second is inductive, and the third is abductive. So, deductive means that you have two premises, two universal premises, and then the conclusion necessarily necessarily follows the premise. For example, let's say every man is mortal, right? My premise one, my one is every man is mortal. My premise two is Socrates was a man. Hence, my conclusion is going to be hence Socrates is mortal or was mortal. Okay? So that is deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is that you start with observation first. Okay? So you observe a few things. Let's say I'm observing every day that a particular restaurant is very uh, you know, a lot of people there. Then I'm going to generalize, then I'm going to uh, first give a hypothesis that this part, this restaurant is must have good food, that is why there are so many people there. Okay? And then let's say I generalize it. So this is what happens in science. So you have limited observer, limited, uh, limited, observe, limited data, okay? so you have some observations, and based upon those observations, you generalize. Okay? So let's say, let me give you another example. So let's say, if I drop my mobile phone, I'm not going to do it. But let's say I drop my Nobody mobile phone. <laughs> okay. So I don't have to do experiment on every corner of the earth to prove that it's going to be it's going to behave the same if the conditions are the same. I'm going to generalize that over all the earth, if the conditions are going to be the same, then it's going to behave the same way. So that is induction. 
So therefore, Francis Bacon was the one who was a great proponent of empiricism and induction. And he created a new discipline by the name of new science. And therefore, a lot of societies flourished because of this discipline that was created by Francis Bacon. And one of the societies was Royal Societies, and the most famous member of Royal Society was none other than Isaac Newton. Okay? And Galileo is also the father of modern science, and he was the one who said that, uh, of course, before that as well, this, this idea was there, that the things that we observe can be mathematically represented. And we know now today that the language of science is mathematics. Whenever we present a theory, we, uh, we, we have to put our observ observances in terms of a mathematical equation. So Galileo was the one. Before Galileo, it used to be done, but mainly in astronomy. The mathematics used to be present in astronomy. Muslims did it for a long time. But then Galileo said that it's going to be for all of physics. So we are going to, we are going to assume the uniformity of nature. And because of that uniformity, the mathematics that we are going to do is going to be applicable everywhere. And he was the one who also uh, did a lot of experiments based on the enhanced telescope that he himself made. And therefore, his experimental method and his insistence on using mathematics as the language of science makes him the father of modern physics. And then after Galileo, after the uh, success of Galileo and Francis Bacon and these people, then science flourished in the West, in Europe, particularly, particularly in Western Europe. So then after that, uh, Isaac Newton was the one. So René Descartes and Galileo, they also talked about the theories that were presented by Aristotle about, about nature. And they challenged him. Okay. Uh, uh, Galileo said, Aristotle basically had a theory about motion, and Galileo challenged that theory about motion. That is a little bit, not complicated, but it's a tedious one to escape it. So then, because of that, René Descartes found laws of motion, a few laws of motion, and also Galileo did his thought experiments which challenged Aristot Aristotelian motion theory. And Newton, Isaac Newton was the one who compiled and also put his own input, and he gave his famous three laws of motion. And we all know the three laws. Uh, the first law is that any any object is going to be uh, is going to stay stationary or is going to stay at a constant velocity unless an external force acts on it. The second law is force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the third law is every action has an equal but opposite reaction. So this was the, uh, th these were the three laws which uh, determine all the mechanics of the world. And now Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, and René Descartes also talked about progress. And by progress, they meant scientific progress. And by scientific progress, they meant that if we are able to control the nature and make it so that, make it so that we achieve economic not economic, but industrial growth, and then from that industrial growth, we achieve economic growth. So that is going to be progress. So the reason why we are doing science is because we want to control nature in order to help us achieve industrial and economic growth. So they gave this idea of progress. So this uh, is what summed up the scientific revolution that happened in the West. Now, after the scientific revolution, which happened in the 16th and the 17th centuries, then you had the 18th century, which was the age of enlightenment. Now the West, very much impressed by the scientific progress that was going on, very much impressed by Newton. Now they began to import ideas from science to different fields of, different fields of human experience. So now, the first three people that I'm going to talk about are these three, which are called British empiricists. I'm mainly going to focus on John Locke. So John Locke is this, this person, oops, sorry. John Locke is this guy, then you have got George Berkeley and you have got David Hume. So I'm going to focus more on John Locke. So uh, another context. So when Newton, Isaac Newton was giving his laws and when mm -hmm. René Descartes was still alive, so Europe was going through a period of elaborate religious wars. So anyone has heard of 80 years war, 30 years war, anyone has heard of it? So what was the 80 years war, any idea? 30 years war. Let's talk about 30 years war. So it was a war that lasted for 30 years. Thank you. <laughs> what else? Huh? Protestants versus Catholics. Right? So basically, the Catholic Church for about 1500 years, not 1500 years, for about 700 years, in Western Europe was the 
you can say, had the monopoly over the interpretation of the Bible. Whatever the Catholic Church is going to say, it's going to be the standard inter interpretation. But then, of course, the Catholic Church gained a lot of power, and then as the power, as it happens all the time, it became very corrupt. So they would sell indulgences. So let's say you you did this, maybe you, whatever, I don't know, there were some ridiculous things like, for example, you looked at a woman with lust, you have to pay us, okay, and then we will pray to God and you will be forgiven. So that is what they do, and they would call it indulgences. So any indulgence that you will do, any sin that you will do, just come to us, pay us some money, and you will be forgiven. So then in Germany, modern day Germany, there was a priest by the name of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, okay, Martin Luther. He was in 1517. Okay, so Martin Luther was the one who attacked the church. Okay, and he wrote a thesis and he packed it on the door of the church. And he said that the church is very corrupt, they are devils, and we should be interpreting, interpreting the Bible by ourselves. So if it is for all of us, we should be interpreting it by ourselves and not relying it on the church, which is corrupt. And that led to a movement which is now called Protestant Reformation. Everyone before that was Catholic. Right? But then after Martin Luther and then after Henry VIII, so Henry VIII was the king of England. He also had a dispute with the church at that time. One year afterwards, he basically wanted a divorce, but the church would not give him divorce. So he said, okay, halas, I'm going to create my own church, go away. Okay, so Henry VIII then created the Church of England and he became separated from the Catholics. And uh, Martin Luther, he also started his movement which gained a lot of followers in Germany. And then there was others, Calvin as well. So they became Calvinist. Martin Luther, the followers of Martin Luther became Lutherian. Okay. So these people then started spreading and Protestantism started spreading. And there were many sects that emerged in Christianity before that, but they were violently crushed, brutally crushed. But the Protestant Reformation, the Catholics could not crush it. Any idea why? Because they suffered by the princes of uh, Holy Roman Empire. So, sorry? The princes of princes. Germany supported the, like, the Reformation. Yes, yeah, some of them. But why initially, like 1517, why did not why did they not just go and kill uh, Martin Luther and his, uh, some of his followers? He was busy with his own problems. Yes, yes, they are busy with his own problems. There were several reasons, but one of the main reasons was that the Habsburgs were Catholics, who were the main Catholic kingdom at that time, and the Spanish. The Spanish were also had Habsburg, and austro Hungarian Empire was also had Habsburg. Okay? So they were the Catholics. They were the ones that they were that were the most powerful. So they were scared that the Ottomans are going to attack them if they are going to go into Germany and are going to go after the Protestants. The Ottomans are going to come and attack them. And that is why they were not able to commit their army. And because, partly because of the reason that they were scared of Ottomans attacking them, the Protestant Reformation survived and it spread all over Europe. And then later as well, when the Spanish wanted to invade all of the areas that became Protestant, then the Ottomans supported the areas that were Protestant. Basically, the areas that were Protestant, they asked Ottomans for help, and the Ottomans supported them. Areas such as the Netherlands, England. England survived because of the Ottoman Empire. And yeah, they, was, uh, they were supported by the Ottoman Empire, which was the major power at that time. And that is why the Protestant Reformation became successful. Now, Protestant Reformation occurs in 1517 and 1618, 101 years afterwards. There is a dispute between the Protestant and the Catholics, and it goes out into an all-scale war. Now they are fighting against each other. And the fight becomes extremely brutal. It is said that in Germany, because the fight, the center of the fight was Germany, that in Germany, 60% of the population of Germany was exterminated in that particular fight. In World War II, I think there was 30 or 40% of, 30 of the, German, the German population died. Uh, maybe it was less than that even. But in the, oh, the in the 30 years war, 60% of German population was exterminated. So it was an extremely brutal and elaborate religious war. So there was this person called Thomas Hobbes. And he was during that time when his, these wars were happening. So he gave his theory. And of course, when these wars are happening, the Catholics are fighting against Protestants. And then the Protestants are fighting against each other. right? So the Calvinists are fighting against Lutherians. Right? So all of these elaborate religious wars are happening. So now, Someone has to, right, by necessity, has to come of something, a political system, which is going to be devoid of religion. Okay? So that became a necessity. And Thomas Hobbes then was the one who took the initiative. And then he said that he applied, he did some pseudoscience. Okay, he did some thought experiment. He said, okay, how about back in the days, how, how were the people back in the days? Let, let me think about it. So he said 
that people back in the days okay. were individuals. Okay, they were not a part of society, they would not live with each other, they were just individuals. And they would always be fighting against each other, killing each, each other. So some of the individuals, they came together and they formed a community, right? And they appointed a leader and they said that, and they said to the leader that we are going to pay you the taxes, okay? And your responsibility is to prevent us from killing each other. So that is what we, this is the thought experiment that we did. And then he came up with the idea of natural rights okay, and individualism. Individualism means that everybody, this, the normal nature of a human being is as an individual, okay, not as a community. And we only come to a community when we want to protect each other from harm. So therefore we give the taxes to the government which the, and the responsibility of the government is to protect us from harm, okay, protect us from killing each other. And John Locke further expanded upon it and he gave his theory of natural rights, okay, which morphed into what we call liberalism. Today. So John Locke said that he started his premise by saying that every human being is the owner of his own body and property. And he was a devout Christian. Any idea what is the problem with this? Islamically, Islamically, what is the problem? Our body is an amana. Allah owns our body, right? It is not our body. Allah owns our body and our property, everything. Okay. So he started with this premise that human beings, individuals, are the owners of their body and their property. And every individual has a natural right. And that natural right is liberty, right? Property and life. So his life has to be preserved, his freedom, liberty has to be preserved and his property has to be preserved. Now you have a problem. What about if, let's say, I am so free that I am preaching on someone else's freedom? Okay. So this is now a problem. Okay. So John Locke also addressed this problem and he said that we have another thing called the natural law. And the natural law is that you do not breach someone else's natural right. Okay. So every individual has his, his controls his own body and his own property, is the owner of his own body and his own property, and he's born with some natural rights. And these natural rights are that he is equal to other human beings and he has right to property, life, and liberty. Okay. And the natural law that he should abide by is that he should not in, in, uh, infringe upon other people's natural rights. Okay. And therefore, he came up with this solution. And then he said that now the individuals are the ones who give consent to the government. So the government is only, uh, the government is only responsible for protect, protecting individuals from impinging on and uh, infringing upon each other's natural rights. Okay. So that is the responsibility of the government. And the government is not responsible for determining what religion a person is following. Okay. So now, this was a very uh, comprehensive sort of uh, detail that he put in his letter of toleration and his other books as well. So now that gave rise to what we call liberalism. Okay. Liberalism is based upon individualism and is based upon the uh, idea that every individual is the sole owner of his own body and property. And that also gave the rise to what we call secularism today. And he said that the state does not have any right to interfere in the religion of an individual. And therefore that idea then morphed into what we call secularism. And secularism and religious tolerance. So he said that every individual has the right to decide what religion he has to be. As long as it is Protestant religion. <laughs> okay. Every Protestant has the right to be a uh, Protestant, whatever Protestant he wants to be. He said, no Catholics, no no Mohammedans, Protestant, any Protestant is fine. What is Mohammedan? Uh, that is the <laughs> word for Muslims that we speak. Same as Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Followers of Christ and followers of Muslims. Yeah. Okay, so another very important theory that he gave was empiricism. Again, we discussed about empiricism when we were doing Francis Bacon. And uh, he also, John Locke also said that human beings are born clean slate, blank slate, so we have no knowledge. And then through experience we gain all knowledge. Okay, so we are born, he said, tabula rasa. Tabula rasa means we, are, we have no knowledge, okay, literally devoid of any knowledge, any innate ideas. And then once we experience things, then we write on that clean slate. Okay. So let's say we experience fire, okay, and then we write on the clean slate, oh, fire is hot, don't, don't mess with it. Okay. So that is what John Locke came up with. And he also David Hume. So just a brief thing on David Hume. He was a he was a you can say probably the greatest atheist philosopher. I would consider him the greatest atheist philosopher. Okay. 
and David Hume gave this idea of naturalism. So naturalism means that whenever we are referring to, when, whenever we are giving any explanations, we will give only natural explanations. So natural laws, natural laws exist, natural phenomena exist, any supernatural phenomena, any supernatural thing does not exist. So this is extremely important because science adopted it. Science adopted naturalism. So in science, we cannot say, oh, God created it or God did it. Okay? Because in science, we only have to give naturalistic explanations. Whenever we give explanations, we have to give naturalistic explanations. And it is called, method. Uh, right now in science, it is called methodological naturalism, which means only natural explanations are allowed, no appeal to supernatural. So anyone who says that science is value neutral is actually wrong. It's not true. So understood right till here, skepticism and everything here. Yeah. So what is the last sentence you said? Sorry. I said that anyone who says that science is value neutral is actually wrong. Science is not value neutral. Value neutral. Value neutral means that there is no value that comes with science. Science is based upon a set of established values. So yeah, so these are the enlightenment philosophers. They are all from Britain, so therefore, therefore they are called British. So that, that is why their philosophy is called British imperialism. Now, in Britain, civil war happens, and after that civil war, the parliamentarians win the civil war, and a constitutional monarchy is established. Okay, civil war is about 1650s, so constitutional monarchy means that the monarch, the king, is bound by constitution. But in France, it is the king pretty much can do whatever he wants, and the king has the support of the Catholic Church. So the type of secularism which emerges in France is much more radical, as we know today as well. It's much more radical than what happens in Britain. Okay. So now in France, we have got what we call the philosophes. Okay. Now these philosophes, there were four of them who were, I mean, there were a lot of them, but there were four of them who were the most prominent. The ones I'm trying, I will try my best to do a French accent. Okay? So <laughs> correct me if I'm not. Right. So there was this person called Montesquieu. Montesquieu. Okay. Montesquieu, right? Mm -hmm. So Montesquieu was the one who said that we should, the Catholic Church and the King, they are too powerful. They have, they are colluding with each other, and they are too powerful. Therefore, what we must have is the system, the kind of system that we have in Britain, and we should separate the powers. The executionary power should be separate from the judicial power. Okay. So Montesquieu was the one who said it, and uh, was the one who said it in the West and in France. And then afterwards, there was another one by the name of Voltaire. Yeah? And Voltaire was, uh, uh, you can say, a critic of the, they would call it the uh, ancient reg regime, which means the, the regime, the sort of laws that they had at that time in France. And he was a, he used to criticize them heavily. And what he's known for is criticizing organized religion, especially Christianity, especially Catholicism. So he would criticize it, call it corrupt, call it, uh, yeah, all sorts of things. Okay. And he was the, he was very influential in these philosophers were very very influential in two revolutions in America and in France. Okay. Now afterwards we have the third person by the name of uh, Rousseau. Rousseau. And Rousseau was the one who was inspired by John Locke and he said that uh, uh, the government should be representative of the collective will of the people. John Locke he basically changed John Locke's theory a little bit. John Locke said that the government should be representative of the individual will of the people. Okay. And he said, no, it's not the individual will, it should be the collective will. And whenever you go to them, dem democracy, democracy is this and democracy is that, you will always hear this word, collective will of the people. Okay. So this has come from Rousseau, who, gave his, uh, who wrote his book, The Social Contract, which was very important. And these uh, philosophers then inspired the two revolutions in America and in France. And therefore, the first liberal states were created due to the ideals that were spread uh, the ideals of enlightenment that were spread, and they were spread because the, because of the printing press, because these uh, books that were uh, printed were readily available, and therefore ideas could be spread all over Europe. All over Europe. Another very important person is going to be Immanuel Kant, but I'm not going to discuss it because he's probably the most the most brilliant philosopher of the enlightenment era. So I'm just going to discuss about. Uh, universal democracy and international cooperation. Right? So he said that democracy, so now Rousseau, is, Rousseau and John Locke are talking about the will of the people should be represented, so a type of democracy. And Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant expanded it to the whole world. Okay? So democracy should be universal, it should be everywhere. 
and he also talked about the ontological morality, which is a sort of morality which is based upon a set of ideals. Okay, set of ideals he called it uh, categorical imperative. So that means that there are a few ideals. So let's say we, we are not going to steal, okay, and that has to be obeyed. We are not going to kill. That has to be obeyed. There is there is no there is no let's say for example if there is someone who follows Kantian morality, if I am going to tell him okay. Uh, sh should I lie? He will say, no, you should not lie. Now, I'm going to ask him, what if I want to save my life? So, someone who follows the Kantian morality is bound to say that you cannot lie even if you have to save your life. Okay? So, this is the ontological morality. So, why is it important to mention here? Because we see with here, before the scientific revolution, the church controlled what the people believed in about the outer world. Okay? And after the scientific revolution, it was the scientists that, that began to inform the people about what is going on in the outer world. Now, the scientific revolution inspires the revolution, other sorts of revolution, and the other revolution is the political revolution. Okay? Liberalism, things are uh, liberalism, how government should be organized. Okay? So these things are inspired by the philosophers that were themselves inspired by the scientific revolution. Now, after that, the domain of religion is shrinking and shrinking. Okay? Now it is to morality. It's only, it's, uh, it has only shrink to morality. Now, that domain is also taken over by human beings. Okay, from Immanuel Kant and also the ones who preceded him, but Immanuel Kant was extremely influential. So now he's talking about morality from reason and not from scripture. Okay. And now capitalism, I'm going to skip it, so Adam Smith came up with his ideal, so he was also inspired by the scientific method. Okay. All of them inspired by the scientific method. So he said, I'm going to find the laws, just as Newton, Newton find the laws of nature, right? the laws of mechanics, I'm going to find the laws of economics. And he wrote his book, The Wealth of Nations, and he say, said that this is all the labor theory of value, the laissez-faire economy, right? All of this was present in there. And they were very original ideas at that time in Europe, and therefore he became very influential, and he's called the father of capitalism, or the father of modern economics. Whereas if we go a little bit further back, 250 years ago, there was another Muslim guy by the name of Ibn Khaldun, who also said, said very similar things. And it is now speculated that uh, uh, Adam Smith somehow read it in Khatun. It is speculated, of course, we don't have a complete evidence. Now, enlightenment ends here, and it is extremely influential. Okay. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about these three or four people. And the first one, these are the post-enlightenment thinkers. Okay. The first one right here, you see here, oops, sorry, is Jeremy Bentham. Okay. And this Jeremy Bentham, if you can see, this guy, it is his real body, it is in UCL, it is his real body. And you see the head there. So what, what, what happened was that when he died, uh, he said that I have, I have so much belief in science that my body is going to be resurrected by science in, in near future, that's for sure. Okay. And he told his friend that you should preserve my body. But the friend messed up his head. <laughs> when, he was, when he was preserving the body, he messed up the head, and the head started rotting. So they had to literally cut his head, and had to preserve it separate. So therefore, it is present in UCL University, University College London in England. And you see his entire body. They have a prosthetic head, and his real head is down there. So Jeremy Bantham was the one who presented the idea of consequentialism. So he said that the... Uh, Emmanuel Kant said that the morality is based upon a few principles that cannot be violated. Jeremy Bentham said, Jeremy Bentham criticized John Locke and all of these uh, philosophers and he said that these natural rights that they are talking about, they do not exist. He said they are nonsense on stills, okay? in modern terms, non nonsense on steroids. Okay? So he said that these natural rights do not exist, they are not scientific enough. So let me give you a scientific explanation of human morality. He said that he did pseudoscience again and he said, that the uh, human beings are motivated by two gods. He literally mentioned two gods. Okay. So the law, the moral law of human beings is that they are motivated by two gods. One is pain, the other is pleasure. And what human beings do is that they try to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. And therefore the morality that we are going to have is going to be the morality which is going to produce the maximum amount of pleasure for maximum number of people and is going to reduce pain. So that morality then became consequentialism. And these, all of these ideas are going to then inspire the, the Muslim later as well. Inspire, they're going to influence the Muslim. Okay. So, sorry, sorry, gentlemen. Isn't that a similar idea to, I forget the term, Mithi Lay? Mithi Yeah, is that the same thing? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. 
now afterwards this this person oh man this person is august pomp august pomp okay. august pomp was a french uh, french philosopher again inspired by the scientific method he said that now i am going to apply scientific method in how humans behave in a society and he called it the social sciences so he is the father of social sciences so and he said after the food right after the food oh much after the food yeah much after the food So this is the 19th century or this is the uh, this is the 19th century yes enlightenment is 18 these are the 19th century this is right august pomp yeah august pomp a a u g u s t c o m p e you have the pomp the cheese right so this guy is the same pomp <laughs> august pomp so he then became the father he applied it to society and then he became the father of social sciences and he also gave uh, and he also said he also imported the idea of progress from sciences and he also applied it to human society and he said that human societies especially the west is also progressing he, and the west he divided human societies in, into three phases the first is the theological phase which is the amateur phase right the, the human beings are babies so they believe in a god they believe in these things right so they are uh, they believe in god or gods So therefore, the first amateur stage, the first baby stage, is the theological stage, according to him. Other people are wrong. The second stage is the metaphysical stage. So the human beings they mature, and they start talking about. They do not talk about God, but they talk about first causes, right? So this is the first cause, and the philosophical. They start uh, speaking about God in a philosophical language. Okay. So that is the first, the second stage, which he called it the metaphysical stage. Okay. And then he said, now final stage of human evolution is where the West is heading, and that is positivism. which means that we reject everything metaphysical we reject our god we reject everything and we only accept the things that they are senses can be okay okay so then therefore he introduced so so interest by science because science is the science is related to the things that we can detect so he said he took it to a logical not logical conclusion he took it to an extreme conclusion and he said that we are only going to accept the peak of rationality is that we only accept the things that we can detect through senses okay and this positivism then came and then later in the 20th century then anti positive positivists came and they defeated the positivists positivists so then positivism then went out of fashion until after 911 the idiot what was the name of that idiot which one someone uh, someone richard idiot. richard richard dawkins right sorry, richard yeah dawkins. richard dawkins and these idiots so they again revived positivism but again it was dead long before all of these survived after it got It, it should be dead by by now. I mean, it, I think it's dead by now. So, yeah. Then Charles Darwin again came with his theory of evolution, right? And theory of evolution by natural selection. So evolution, the theory of evolution was present much before that Charles Darwin in ancient India. And then, but Charles Darwin gave the mechanism that natural selection is what uh, is what causes the species to change from one form to another. And then what happened? So this is speciation. Yeah, right now it's speciation. Charles Darwin said natural selection. Okay. So now, after Charles Darwin presented this theory, this became a theory in biology. So therefore, what happened? The social science people they imported that theory as as it happened all throughout. The theme is this: they imported that theory into social social sciences as well. And then finally, this guy Herbert Spencer said that the powerful. So he he applied the theory of evolution into social sciences, and he said that the powerful. Are eventually going to overcome the weak, and the weak are going to be exterminated. And this social Darwin, this social science, this pseudo science, which is called social Darwinism, is what allowed the European powers to exterminate the enemies, right? And because they they were able to, not the Nazis as well, they, uh, they said that uh, we are a superior race, right? So we will be able to replace the inferior races. That's eugenics. Right? Eugenics, yes. This What, that. What's the name again? Uh, Herbert Spencer. Yes. Okay. Now, very long, elaborate uh, uh, history of Western civilization. Not it's it's like many things that I have skipped, but the things that have inspired the Muslims I have just put in there. So, modernism can be summarized into these uh, these axioms. So, the first one is that removal of God and religion as the center of human activity. and now collectively human beings are going to be are going to decide what is going to be the best for them secondly 
reason, science, mathematics provide objective and reliable basis of knowledge. Okay, so we can get reliable knowledge, objective knowledge from reason, from science, from mathematics. Okay. Then thirdly, language is transparent, which means that we can we can observe a few things. We can observe the objective reality, and then we can express it through language. Okay. And then we can disseminate it, and everyone is going to understand it. So. Uh, an opposite would be language is subjective. So I am just thinking, I am just understanding it in some other way. You are understanding it in some other way. So that is postmodernism, which we'll do later in the next one. Okay. So the the fourth one is human conditions continue to progress, which we just discussed. Okay. The fifth one is that law of nature also applies to human beings. And then the final one, freedom in the form of democracy and the free markets are the natural natural extension of universally true reasonable beliefs. Okay. So. Democracy, okay, capitalism, free markets. So these are naturally true beliefs, applicable universally. Okay. So these are the idea. Is this, this is modernism, summed into six or seven uh, points. Okay. Yeah. Understood, right? In here. Everything. So thank you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we go to the meat. No, I think there's a question. Yes, please. The question is alright. So. Um, why oh, maybe, maybe later, okay, right, maybe later, because this is going to take some time. So, now, Muslims first encountered modern technology when the Ottoman Empire, they, the Ottoman Empire was uh, used to be successful against the European powers in the 15th and the 16th, and in some instances in the 17th century as well. They considered themselves as superior to, or at least equal to the European powers. But then, at the a end of the 18th century, they were defeated pretty badly by the Russians, by the Austrians, and they realized that it is that their army has become outdated. So therefore, this this uh, king, the Ottoman Sultan, by the name of Salim the Third, he started uh, modernizing his army and uh, making it, making the equipment modern, organizing it along European lines. But then the Janissaries, that were the elite soldiers of the Ottoman Empire, they had become very corrupt. Right, they, so therefore they resisted it, and they uh, organized a coup against Salim, and Salim was killed in 1807. But then the Ottoman army modernization was put into place by Salim, but then he was killed by the general. And then afterwards, in 1798, uh, this is the turning point. In 1798, now Napoleon, who's the uh, Napoleon, was the superstar general at that time of, of uh, France. So he says that I'm going to spread the enlightenment ideals into the barbaric orient. And then I'm going to, so that barbaric orient became the, 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 the barbaric orient that he was discussing about was Egypt. So he said that I'm going to take the enlightenment values to Egypt. And he invaded Egypt in June, 1st June 1798. And in that he brought with himself 167 scientists and philosophers and all of his Arabicists, Arabicists right, who would, would tell them about the Arabic language. And two printing press, one in Latin and one in Arabic. So that was the first printing press outside of Turkey in the Muslim world. So, and then he came here, his main objective was to prevent the British, to drive the British out of India. So he wanted the control of the Swiss Canal and the, all of these places, so therefore he invaded Egypt. So he said that I'm going there to ally with Tipu Sahib, Tipu Sultan, and to drive the British out of the out of India, so because India was the richest country in the world at that time, so therefore anyone who takes India becomes the king of the world. Right? So therefore, they had to. Uh, they, the plan uh, was to drive the British out. Now Napoleon comes to Egypt. Egypt is under Ottoman Empire, but the local rulers are still the Mamluks. Napoleon easily defeats them, and then for establishes uh, establishes uh, 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 rule is rule over Egypt. And then once Napoleon establishes his rule, then he, the British, they uh, started supporting the Ottomans against Napoleon. And the British, they defeat Napoleon and his fleet in the Battle of Nile River. And Napoleon is uh, extremely unhappy at that, and he attacks Syria. And now he's in Egypt. Egypt is far away from Ottoman Empire. But now he went and he attacks Syria. And he's a bit successful, but then the Ottomans, they ally with the British, and they are able to defeat Napoleon. Okay, Not defeat, but they are able to resist the siege that he had in Acre. Now, once the Ottomans, they encounter Napoleon and his forces, and they're, they're so easily defeated by Napoleon, so then they go into overdrive, that they have now have to do something, because the West is so far ahead of them. 
So then Mahmoud II, the uh, Ottoman Sultan, after after uh, Salim, I think it was Mustafa, Mustafa the Fourth, and then after Mustafa became came Mahmoud, and Mahmoud was the one who started these administrative and fiscal reforms, and he uh, introduced the Tanzimat reforms in Turkey, and these Tanzimat reforms were the reforms that were put in place in order to drive Turkey towards modernization. And some of the features of Tanzimat are like this. So guaranteed life and property rights, which is guaranteed in Islam as well, so I don't know why they have to re-mention it. Instituted tax regulations, outlawed execution without trial, which is also Islamic. Abolished the Zimni status. So you had the non-Muslims that used to live under Zimni status, and he abolished it. The Tanzimat reforms abolished the Zimni status and made everyone an equal citizen. And basically, the Christians at that time, they revolted against it. They said that, no, we need our autonomy. Because in the Zimni status, when they had the Zimni status, they had, they had the, what was that system called? Jizya? No, 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 no. <laughs> Jizya is the tax. The system, the Millat system. Okay, they had the Millat system. And in that system, the, 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 the non-Muslims had semi-autonomous areas where they could pretty much do whatever they want. But now, due to the centralization of the government, they revolted, they, they said that they, we need the more autonomy, we don't, we don't want to designate status to be abolished, but it was abolished anyway, and everyone became an Ottoman citizen. And then established Western schools and encouraged Ottomanism. Okay, so uh, now the West is going through a period of national, nationalization, and therefore the Ottomans said, okay, we have to... Uh, nationalism. Nationalism, sorry, my bad. Sorry, my bad. Sorry, you to to Okay, so nationalism, and the Ottomans also wanted to introduce that nationalism into their own land. Okay. And they, but the problem was that the Ottoman Empire had so many ethnicities, so many religions, different religions. So what they have to do is so they have to this, construct this Ottomanism, this uh, uh, thing, and then they have to feed it to people that you are now an Ottoman. Empire. You are the subject of uh, the Ottoman Empire, and therefore you should recognize yourself as such. And then that culminated in the first constitution in the Ottoman Empire in 1876. So this was the first, uh, this was an instance of modernization in the Islamic world. It started with the Ottoman Empire, mainly Turkey. And then Egypt as well. Now, Ottoman Empire, they sent a particular person by the name of Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali Pasha. He was sent to Egypt uh, as a wali, but then he declared that he's sovereign. And then the Ottomans sent an army, he defeated the army. So therefore, Egypt was technically on the map, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, but uh, re in, in reality, it was sovereign. Okay? And Muhammad Ali established his own uh, his own empire at that time okay? in Egypt. And he wanted to. Uh, he was very much impressed by Napoleon and his army and Western style uh, Western style uh, weapons. So he wanted to also modernize Egypt. So he introduced these reforms, such as he uh, advanced, such as he established institutions for education and military training engineering, vet veterinary science, medicine, civil administration, translation, primary schools that were based on Western uh, model. Okay. And these, his, Muhammad Ali and his successors uh, basically established all of these things, Western, uh, the Western inspired institution into Egypt. Okay. Now, India. India, the British arrived in India in 1757. Uh, not arrived, they arrived in India in 1600. But they start getting control of Indian lands in 1757. When uh, they start with Bengal, when uh, Robert Clive defeats Sirajit Taula. And slowly and gradually, Britain becomes the dominant power in India. By the time, by 1856, it controls all of India. So, a mutiny happens in 1857. The soldiers, the Indian soldiers, they rebel against the British. And now the British want to do something. Okay, they don't want, they are only 4,000, and they are ru ruling over 400 million Indians. Okay, they don't want Indians to unite and then to fight against them. That is going to be disastrous. So now they have to do something. So what they do is, the first thing that they do is that they create tensions between Hindus and the Muslims. Okay, that is a topic for another day. But we are only concerned with Muslims now. So another thing that they do is that they recognize that Islam is something that is preventing them from establishing their ideals in the land, in the lands, in the Muslim lands that they rule. So they, they were in Malaysia, Sudan, and they came into Egypt as well. We'll discuss it later. In India, right? so the Muslim ulama, they were trying to 
uh, introduced they introduced Western style education in India, and they were trying to uh, spread their ideas of liberalism and all all of the ideas that they had the scientific technology progress and you you have to secularism right. They were trying to spread that, but then the ulama were the ones who were resisting it. So the British then went. The British then realized that in order to establish their authority in the Muslim regions that they ruled, they have to reform Islam throughout the dominions that they rule them. Okay? So reform means that you have to liberalize Islam. Okay, you have to make liberalism primary, and then the other things are going to be second. So now they pick someone in India that uh, they thought was a friend to them, and his name was Sayyid Ahmad. Sayyid Ahmad al-Muttaqi bin Muhammad al-Taqwi. Sayyid Ahmad al-Taqwi bin Muhammad al-Muttaqi. So a lot of taqwa in the, in the house. Okay. So he, they established him. And they picked him up and they supported him. And he established the first hybrid college in Muslim world. Okay. That hybrid college was the college which used to provide religious education as well as the secular education. And that was called the Muhammadan Anglo-Oriental College. Okay. And this person is Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, very famous all over India. How, how famous is Sir Sayyid in India? Not famous? Really? Really? Okay. I have not heard. You have, you have not heard of Sayyid Ahmad Khan? Really? Wow. Okay. So, Sayyid Ahmad Khan uh, is, is the ideological father of Pakistan. He, not ideological, yeah, you can say Iqbal, Iqbal, they say Iqbal, but then Sayyid Ahmad Khan was the one who put the wheels in motion. Okay. So, you can ask him the Q&A how. Okay. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so they told you they told you this is why Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan and they established this college in 1875 called the Muhammadan Anglo, so Western, Oriental, Eastern College. And then this college becomes successful. We we'll talk about some of the things in the latest slide. And the British, so in Egypt, uh, the Egyptians they borrow a lot of money from Europe and they're not able to repay it. So the British, they, they, they take control on the, so now Egyptian faces, Egypt faces a revolt, the Urabi revolt it is called, and they started nationalizing their assets. So the British and the French, they do not want it. They want the control of Swiss Canal. So the British, on the pretext of uh, defending the Europeans that were there in Egypt, they invade all of Egypt. And they become the de facto rulers, even though on paper, the, there was this Egypt, two Egyptian ruler by the name of Kofi. He was on paper the ruler, but then, Back in, in, uh, in behind the scenes, the British were the ones who were controlling. Right, so they were the de facto rulers of Egypt from 1882 until 1956. So now, after the establishment of Anglo-Oriental College and its success, now the British want to uh, replicate this into Egypt, and they start. Uh, they they pick the institution that was the premier institution in the whole of Islamic world, by the name Al Azhar. That was the Madrasa Al Azhar, and they pick someone that they thought is going to liberalize Al Azhar as well. Okay? And the name of that scholar was Muhammad Abdu. Okay? And Muhammad Abdu was uh, uh, someone who, again, uh, he, he was inspired by Western ideals, but he wanted to uh, synthesize it, not synthesize it, but he, he had this idea that Islam is compatible with uh, modernity. Okay. Islam is compatible with many of the modern ideas, okay, which we'll discuss it later as well in the later time. Now, before Muhammad Abdu, the mentor of Muhammad Abdu is Jamaluddin Afani. Okay, so, in order to understand Muhammad Abdu, it is important to understand uh, Jamaluddin Afani. So, uh, there was this uh, French or Orientalist by the name of Ahne Pena. Okay, Pena. Okay, in 1883, he said that it is our duty to invade Muslim lands and to save uh, Muslims from Islam. And he said this, uh, that the Muslims convinced that God gives fortune and power to those who obey him, irrespective of education or personal merit. The Muslim has the most profound contempt for education, science, and everything that makes up the European mind. <laughs> okay, so he gave this famous, <laughs> famous speech. Jamaluddin Afghani, again, he was a modernist as well, and I'm not praising or criticizing anyone, I'm just telling you what, what happened. Okay. So Jamaluddin Afghani was also belonged to Freemason. So he he wrote a refutation 
and then that reputation then became a standard reputation for many, many years, hundreds of years, even now, even though that is flawed in, in, in certain uh, premises. So he said that the science that you Europeans are doing is the continuation of the science that you Muslims did. So we did science, and then you took it from us, and then you are continuing. Okay. So that is what he said. He said, everything that you are doing, it came from us. Okay. So you have to be thankful to us. So that is the reputation that he gave. He was in France at that time, and he wrote French. So I don't know if he wrote French, but the article that he wrote was in French. So uh, that then became the standard reputation which the Muslim uh, scholars use for many, many years, even though it has a major flaw, which we are going to discuss later. Okay. So Jamaluddin Afghani again did not understand Western science that, that well, okay? but he was convinced that modernity and uh, Islam, can, they can be a happy medium ground that can be found, and therefore there's, there's some sort of reform, reformation that needs to happen, and Muhammad Abdu was his disciple. Okay? Jamaluddin Afghani was his mentor. And Muhammad Abdu, the British depict Muhammad Abdu, and therefore the reformation of Al-Azhar University started. So in 1896, Al-Azhar's bureaucracy, so you have to understand that back in the days, before modernity came to the Muslim lands, the madrasa was very much informal. So it was like, uh, there's a teacher, and it, the teacher has a circle, and I'm going to go into that circle, and I'm going to copy the teacher. Okay, the teacher is going to teach me, and then I'm going to copy the mannerisms of the, of the teacher, so this is how the sharia has to be done. Okay, so the sharia does not have to be taught by just giving you the paper, it has to be learned by observing the teacher. Okay. So you had these informal circles, it was not a formal university. So now Abdu wanted to reform Al Azhar and make it a formal university and also to introduce modern sciences in Al Azhar, to okay, make it a university. So the process started in 1896 when Al Azhar's bureaucracy was expanded, so it became more centralized and non religious subjects such as arithmetic, geometry, and geography were added to the standardized curriculum. Okay. Now, finally, so there were different, now Muslims intellectuals, when they started realizing that now they are faced with modernity, so they gave different intellectual responses to modernity. So the first response was a reaction, and that was by the ulama, they said that we are going to reject everything. No, more, no modern science, no nothing from the West, we are not going to take anything. And of course, uh, that did not, uh, uh, that did not, that was not successful because the British and French were there for a longer period of time, and they were powerful, powerful. So this kind of complete rejection, and uh, you can say, how how would I put it? The the how, how would I put it? They did not want to engage with it, right? They, they did not want to do anything with it. They said that just keep it separate. Okay, if you want to establish something. Uh, related to modernity, just do it somewhere else, do not bring it to al okay. But then, of course, the British and the French were there in the Muslim land, so the Muslims were compelled to answer to modernity. Okay. And they did it in different ways. So the first trend that established was the criticism of Takhli. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because this is something which a scholar should talk about, some a layman like me should not talk about. So Takhli was basically following a school of thought. Okay. And Takhli also meant that following your teacher. So many scholars who were uh, who wanted to uh, who wanted to you can say modernize not modernize sort of like uh, how would you say bring modernity right modernity ideas to the Muslim world they said that uh, taklid is something that should not be done okay this is uh, we should we should be using our reason more and we should not be doing blind, blind taklid now I'm not going to comment and I'm going to move on to the next one okay, because this. This is very important to, in order to understand the points that are going to be rejected. Now, once taqlid is being rejected, so now you have to go back to the sources, the original sources of the Quran and the Sunnah. So there became an increasing, increased emphasis on Quran and its interpretation. So now you can see that the literature on the Quran became more and more. Now it has both positive and negative effects. So the positive effect was that the Muslims, so let's say for example, if, if I give you the example of Indian subcontinent. So in the Indian subcontinent, the madrasa system was uh, that the uh, students in madrasa would spend a lot of time studying fiqh because that is what they used to practice. Okay. 
and they would spend some time studying Quran and they would spend as much time studying Quran as they would spend on studying Greek philosophy. Because the one that was the thing that was most useful was fifth, because they would practice it in, in actual life. So that is why they would study it. Now increased emphasis, uh, increased uh, amount of emphasis began to be placed upon Quran. Right? And now therefore a movement emerged in India, right? So primarily that movement was against countering the foreign uh, the modern, modern influence in Islam. And that movement was the one movement. And other similar movements also happened all across the Muslim world. But uh, it's, uh, especially in India and Egypt, because these two were the scholarly hubs of the world, of the Muslim world at that time. Okay. Now, Deoban, what they wanted to do is that they wanted to keep the Hanifi Fiqh, but they wanted to ground it, ground it in Quran and Hadith. Okay. So they came up with something much more robust than what used to be practiced back in the days. Right? Something that a positive thing that happened. And India then became the Deoban, the Darul Loom in Deoban then became the, you can say, after Al Azhar became the most productive. Uh, you can say the, the most number of, uh, the most output of Islamic literature came from Darul Ulum. And then what happened was that some of the people who were inspired by modernity, they began interpreting the Quran in the lens of modernity. Okay, so they rejected everything of tradition, no taqlid, all tradition is rejected. I'm going to interpret the Quran like, like how I have like I'm Okay, and uh, the first one that I'm going to discuss is Sayyid Ahmad Khan himself, Sir Sayyid himself. <laughs> so I'm going to give two examples. Okay, so the first example is the example of miracles. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan was pretty much impressed by naturalism. Naturalism, that the things that exist, we discussed that previously in the first time, that the only things that exist are natural. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan was very much impressed by European science, very much impressed by naturalism. So he rejected all miracles. He said miracles, they, they are not miracles, they are just natural phenomena. So when the Allah says to Moses that strike, uh, strike your, how would you put it in yeah. English? Yeah. Asa, but in English. Yeah. <laughs> staff, yeah. Strike your staff, right? And then uh, the, the word in the Quran uses Tawdir Azim. Tawdir Azim means a great, a huge mountain, right? A mountain came. And then Moses went through that mountain. And then Sir Sayyid said, no, no, it's not, it's not a mountain. It was just the wind that came and the tide just shifted. So therefore, the Moses went there in that tide. When the tide was high or low, I don't, I don't know. The tide was low, let's say. And Moses went. And then when Pharaoh came, the tide became high. And therefore, he was down. Okay? So Sir Sayyid interpreted it naturally, in a natural sense. That there's no such thing as miracles. There's only natural. Naturally, pure natural. And then another thing was that Sir Sayyid rejected jinns, rejected angels. Jinns do not exist, angels do not exist, only forces of nature exist. So this is the extreme, you can say one extreme uh, way of looking at the Quran. Okay. So only the forces of nature exist, jinns and angels do not exist. And he had a very funny interpretation of jinn. So in the Quran it is mentioned, right, so that jinn is made up of smokeless fire. So he said that this smokeless fire means that the jinn that the Quran is referring to is a fiery man, right, a man who is very angry, <laughs> he becomes fiery. So that angry man is a jinn. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> okay. And another one was Muhammad Abdu in his Kitabul Manat, not Kitab, Risala. Uh, the Risala that he put was called Man Manat. Okay. And he had his own disciple by the name of Rashid Rida. Rashid Rida here. So Rashid Rida and, uh, and uh, Muhammad Abdu. So they interpreted it. Uh, they accepted the miracles, but then they said that the uh, 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 Muhammad Abdu said that just like the jinn about the jinn, right? So Muhammad Abdu said that the microbes that the West has discovered, they are the jinn. The bacteria, they are the jinn. Uh, so Muhammad Abdu, right? So we also try to put it empirically. So these microbes, they might might be the jinn. The, the actual jinn, maybe not. The microbes are the jinn. And then he also said, Muhammad Abdu also said that uh, Jesus, when in the Quran in Ali Imran, if I'm not mistaken, it said that by the permission of Allah, Jesus had the ability to uh, resurrect the dead. So we said that he had the ability, but he actually did it, we are not sure about it. Okay. So that is what Muhammad Abdul said. So he tried to, you know, he tried to, he was not as extreme as Sayyid Ahmad Khan, but then he tried to reconcile the Quran with modernity in some sense. And then Rashid Rida, his student, then later said that no, I mean, 
or cases are Islam actually get the miracle. Nasheed then later, later, later in his life became much more orthodox, but became very orthodox. So then afterwards, so these kind of, you had these two spectrums, right? One in, in one sense, now increased emphasis is placed on the Quran, and now people are turning more and more towards the Quran, and they are uh, accepting the tradition. And in second sense, they are rejecting all of tradition, making their own interpretations, and they are so making their own interpretation in terms of self again, mostly in terms of self again, because Muhammad Abdu did not do it as extreme as self again, okay? So, and they are completely succumbing to the ideals that were coming from Yoga, okay? And then another trend that was established was that of Maslaha. So Maslaha, anyone can explain what Maslaha is? Yeah. Benefit. Benefit, greater good, uh, right? Interest. Interest in the sense of benefit. Not yes, uh, greater good. Right? So Maslaha is, let's say, if you don't have a precedence from the Quran and the Sunnah, and if you are confronted with a situation, so you pick the option which is going to be the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. So Islamic consequentialism. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, is it that Maslaha was created or Maslaha was made famous? So, yeah, Maslaha was made famous. Yeah. So adoption of uh, Maslaha was not created. <laughs> so, existed. Yeah, so of course, of course. So Maslaha was invoked when trying to adopt the technologies that were coming from the West. Okay. So let's say uh, Western science. Okay. So you have to accept everything that is coming from the West, because otherwise, if you do not accept it, if you do not, in, uh, if you do not learn about it, then we are going to be exterminated. Okay. So Rashid Rida was the one who said it. He's Rashid Rida and Muhammad Abdi. So the Egyptians, they were seeing Algeria, and they were seeing the things that the French were doing in Algeria and they were very scared. And they said that if you are not going to adopt everything that the West is teaching us about science, if you are not going to learn everything, then it is possible that we are going to be exterminated too. Okay. So therefore, it is maslaha, it is in our common good that we learn everything that is coming from the West. Okay, We adopt the science. And then another one was, uh, let's say, Rashid Rida also said about post-mortem. So back in, uh, in, the, in the hadith, and uh, it, is, it is forbidden to mutilate the body, so therefore, Rashid Rida said that it is okay to do post-mortem, okay? So if, 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 if it is more beneficial to do post-mortem, it is okay. And now that opinion is pretty much accepted by, I, I read the opinions of the Hanafis and the, all of the schools of thought, and I think this opinion that if, let's say, you want to, if you want to aid in a criminal investigation, then that exception can be made for post-mortem, okay? So this was a medium, you can say, you can say a more nuanced uh, perspective, of, perspective on Maslaha, and then others then took it to the extreme level. And they said that usury is not allowed, but interest is allowed. <laughs> yeah. So interest, you can have some fixed amount. Usury is when you go above that fixed amount. Okay. So let's say the government fixed the amount is 5%. And if you are taking the interest as 5%, that is allowed. But if you take it more than 5%, that is exploitation and that is not allowed. Okay. So there were many who said it, but I am not going to name them. Okay. Not many, a few said it. So a few scholars, quote unquote, started uh, saying that usually is harm, but interest is harm. So that is another, another extreme version. Now, advocating for reformation of religious institutes, I've already discussed it. So religious institutes become more democratic, uh, not democratic, became more bureaucratic, more centralized. Okay, and that is that has a lot of benefit. That you can have a standard curriculum, right? The modern institutions have a lot of benefit. Okay, you can have a standard curriculum. You can have, you can produce, say, you can produce a standard. Right? You can, you have, you can produce outcome that is of a certain standard. Okay, so the articles that are coming from Harvard or from Stanford, they are at, uh, of a certain standard. Okay, that is because the, it is much more bureaucratic, much more central. But one disadvantage is that it can be controlled by the state very easily. I'm not going to say anything else. Okay. Now, afterwards, another. Uh, trend that, 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 that was established was that the Quran and Hadith began to be seen from the modern lens. Okay, so how do we how do we make Quran and the Hadith applicable to the modern modern uh, the modernity that is being imposed? So now again you had a middle spectrum, a middle ground, in which let's say the uh, emphasis on education was very very much became the topic of the day. Okay, so the scholars began emphasizing on education, which is a good thing. And also about uh, the extreme version that was taken was that you just adopt everything and you, again, just 
do away with the traditions and adopt all the modern ideas. Okay? So for example, this guy, Parvez, okay, and Parvez was the one who rejected the Hadith as well. So when I was talking about increasing emphasis on Quran, so there came a sect, especially among the Indian subcontinent, which also emerged from Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Sir Sayyid Ahmad was the one who said that Hadith, they're not really reliable. Okay? And then people started rejecting the Hadith. And this uh, kind of trend still continues to this day amongst the elite, people in the subcontinent, and also it is very much flourishing in the West. Okay? Now, this Parvez said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a socialist. He said Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a socialist, and his mission was to destroy capitalist Byzantine and Roman Empire and Persian Empire. So that is why he fought against them, because they were capitalists. Okay? So now again, uh, progress, the notion of progress also permeated in, into the minds of the into the minds of the Muslims and also into the minds of the scholars, such as Muhammad Abdu said that the miracles they were applicable for that day because human beings were at a at an infant stage. Okay, so they could only understand through miracles. Whereas now we can understand through reason, so we do not need any miracle. Which I don't know how to. I'm not going to say anything about it, but. In the Quran, it is said that many nations that were more powerful than you were destroyed before. Okay, so the Quran says that there is no linear trajectory that happened. Okay, so maybe this uh, this can be taken in another, another way as well. And then uh, another thing that happened was that uh, we began to think about Islam in the modern context. So that is the, the discuss so out of that is Islamic modes of government. Right? So different theories began uh, began to emerge about how Islam is going to be applicable in the modern context. Okay? So, so let's say you have the Maududi in India, you had Hassan al banna in Egypt, okay? so these people started writing about how the Sharia is going to be applicable in the modern context. And later, uh, I'm going to talk about the last one, last point in the next slide. Okay? So the final slide, which I'm going to do it pretty quickly. So now we discussed about how modernity uh, influenced the upper class, the intellectual class of the Muslim. Okay. Now, I'm going to go and talk about the trickle-down effect that it had. Okay. How does it, uh, how does, how did it impact the psychology of the Muslim? And I'm going to talk more about psychology, not about healthcare systems improved. Of course, they improved. Okay. And education systems they became more prevalent. Of course, they did. Right. So I'm going to talk about more about how Muslims started to think differently, how they were before modernity, modernity came, and how after that. They became started to think differently. So, uh, the Muslims they became more nationalistic. You know, nationalism was imported from Europe. So, if you can see here, Zia Bokal was the nationalist in Turkey, and he uh, was in, he influenced Mustafa Kamal and all of these nationalists. And Ghulam Ahmad Parvez that you see today, I mean that you see on the screen, not today. Ghulam Ahmad Parvez was the one who rejected Hadith as well. Okay. So, he was he met. Iqbal, Iqbal was the ideological father of Pakistan, and he met Jinnah. Okay, Iqbal recommended him to Jinnah. Jinnah is the political founder of Pakistan. And then Jinnah was the one who gave Ghulam Ahmed Parvez the task to write a man, to write a Risala, what do you call it? To write a magazine. Okay. To, to write a magazine. And that the name of that magazine was Tulu Islam. And in that magazine, he promoted the idea that uh, we, we as Muslims must be striving to create a state, okay? And that state has to be created because we need to uh, establish a state which is based upon Islamic laws rather than laws made by man. So then this idea then morphed into the idea of a separate state of Pakistan, and that is why we have the separate state that we have today, okay? And that this narrative became popular among the Muslims in India. So nationalism then rose amongst the Muslims. Arab nationalism, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, that Arab nationalism then also grew, the history is pretty big, but their thesis was that the Arabs, they, when the Muslims were under the rule of the Arabs, when the, uh, when the Rashidun, when the Abbasids, when the uh, Umayyads, they were uh, in power, then the Muslims were very powerful. As long as the Arabs, as long as it moved from the Arabs to the non-Arabs, the Muslims became weak. And I was shocked, it, it is ahistoric, it's not true, and I was shocked, really, as a scholar, uh, was about was also saying these things. I was really shocked to hear about it. But of course, but yeah, these ideas have permeated across uh, across these lines as well. Across, across the scholarly lines, unfortunately, as well. 
so nationalism and then again popularity of western schools and secular education which is not a bad thing at all right so we should be studying science and technology right but uh, i'll be discussing more about it but then amongst the minds of the muslims the western school and secular education became the only option okay. so that is what we do we just grow up we go become doctors and engineers and that's it that is what we do so and then finally a very important point reformed epistemology so epistemology means how we how we know what is what is the right thing or what is true so the entire epistemology of the muslims was reformed so if you look at the all of the pre modern civilizations okay, including the west so you have three things that make up the mind that that make up a society okay that make up the traditions in a society that the common beliefs of a society one is tradition okay the other is analytic thinking and the third is intuition so tradition what you have inherited from your forefathers analytical thinking what you reason okay that is the things that you acquired through reason let's say the uh let's say a basic caliphate came to a certain went to a certain problem and that therefore they gathered their scholars and they told them okay reason which one is going to be the best possible solution okay and then the reason that the conclusion that they came up with then became standardized okay so it was party tradition party reason and party intuition okay so intuitively intuitively feel that god exists okay so human beings as scientifically prove that as well intuitively feel that there is a creator that god exists that there is an afterlife okay so therefore these three then make the uh, then basically decide what is going to be prevalent these three are pre- the you can say combination of these three then make up the ideas that are prevalent in a society okay the west it removed the tradition it removed intuition and it only went purely with analytical thinking not completely removed it but it emphasized the analytical thinking to such a degree that it became uh, you can say it became and the analytical thinking became the primary form of reason so now it was imposed upon the muslims as well the west tried to impose it without the colonialism but it could not because human beings resisted naturally let's say if i'm going to come to mr ahmed and i'm going to say look your tradition it's it's bad you have to give it up right ahmed is going to say no i'm not going to give it up why therefore i have to necessarily colonize him in order to reform his epistemology okay i have to maybe threaten him that i'm going to do something to him right then he is going to be uh, then he is going to reform his epistemology otherwise he is not going to do it so that is what happened with the muslims as well that instead of having a world view which the muslims had before based upon tradition intuition and analytical thinking it became primarily analytical thinking science 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 how we think about science okay? everything has to be measured across science quran why is the quran to scientific miracles scientific miracles i mean it's okay quran has a few things about science of course you think that relate to the universe but quran i mean we do not approach primarily we do not primarily approach quran in order to see scientific miracles in it okay? everything just became analytical thing science and then if you look at the history as well we say golden age golden age when we were good at science when we were good at anal- analytical thinking if you are going to go 300 years back and if you are going to ask any muslim what was the golden age of muslims they would say it was the time of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his sahaba but now no science whenever we are good at science that is the golden age and then of course uh, an inferiority inferiority complex materialism all of these things came into human uh, muslim psychology and then very important disenchantment and in some cases aversion to religious religious tradition and authority so you how many times you see people saying ah this guy really this person i don't respect him i have got secular education this guy i don't respect intellectual bargaining yeah yeah i am intellectual bargaining okay. so i am i am an intellectual this guy doesn't know about the world this guy doesn't know in some cases that is true that some of the ulama they may, some, some of the scholars they maybe are not expert in some field so that is in some cases it is true but then in many cases they are dismissed without even you know without even you know they are not given a second thought right they are dismissed and that used to happen back in the days a lot 60 70 you see uh, people in afghanistan and in pakistan they were very anti religious not anti religious but they were ill religious not anti religious i'm not anti religious but they were not religious at all but then of course there was a revival in orthodoxy which was in orthodox and finally uh, yeah the rise of orthodoxy which is that uh, the movements that were that came out of 
the imposition of modernism, that, that went against the imposition of modernism, okay, those movements then eventually became more and more, we can say more and more influential. And the Muslims, after a brief period of when the Muslims became extremely inspired by the West, now as you can see that the Muslims are slowly, you know, becoming more and more Islamic. If you go to, there are many Muslims who are turning away from Islam, but then there are many who are coming back to Islam as well. So if you go to, let's say, Pakistan or Egypt or any of these areas, you will see a lot more people, let's say, observing the hijab, a lot more women observing the hijab compared to when we used to in the 60s and the 70s. Lots of negativity, let's, let's finish with one positive impact as well, because everything Muslim sees in an optimistic light, so whatever happened, there is something good that is going to come out of it. Now the good that came out of it, the first thing is that the, the Islamic uh, awareness about their own religion, right, which came out because of the rise of the institutions that went against the imposition of modernity, it became more and more. And now, let's say in terms of scholarship, the scholarship that was produced in India, in, in Egypt, so India was back in the days in the 1600s, 1500s, was, was not, did not used to produce that much scholarship. But then during colonialism, after colonialism, now India is producing a lot of scholarship. I think that is because of this. And then now because of colonialism, because of uh, the modern secular education, we have the tools, we have the English language, we have the access to understanding modernity, understanding different world views. We have the tools now to engage with the world and also to uh, become a modern society and to show to the world that we Islam, what Islam is truly about. So back in the days, we could not reach out to the world like we used to, like we, like, uh, we, we can do it now, right now. So, yep. And, yeah, that is it. Any any questions? Yeah. Question. Yes. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, to the first one. So the question is like, um, when you mentioned about, okay, so the first simple question, you mentioned about Thomas Hobbes, right? Thomas Hobbes. We are uh, thinking as individuals. So let's go back, like, uh, before the society, we had individuals, mm. right? And then they came forward to pay tax, mm. right? And then I lost the connection to John Locke. How did Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, how do they do it? Thomas Hobbes used the theory of, sorry, John Locke used the theory of Thomas Hobbes, and he said that yes, human beings are individuals, and they go to the government just so that the government can protect their natural rights. Okay, so he gave this theory of natural rights, and he said that the natural raw law prevents other human beings from infringing upon the natural rights of other human beings. And if they do, the government's job is to protect the natural rights of the individual. Okay. Uh, thank you. And following that, like the important question now is that uh, how did John Locke uh, and the like, chubby guy yeah, and, yeah. and uh, the chubby guy and uh, the other one, uh, they were Indian Swami, Swami. Yeah. The Indian Swami, how did they like got influence? <laughs> How did John Locke influence these? David Hume. Yeah, David, David Hume? Yeah. yeah, so these three are empiricists who say that we, uh, we are born a blank slate and then we acquire knowledge through our experience. There is no a priori knowledge as it is said, right? Which means that there is no innate knowledge, which goes against Islam as well, because in Islam we have the fitra. Okay. So they said that no, there is no such thing as innate knowledge. We have a clean slate that we are born with, and then we put in, uh, through experience, we put in all the knowledge. And then later, August Hom came and he said that there's no such thing as clean state. So you just demolish everything. Uh, that's that's another important. my question. The question is, yeah. how are they able to influence and propagate their ideas? Like, why are because people accept? Because they right. And the, some historians said that the greatest achievement of the Western civilization was that they were able to, uh, they, they, that they were able to gather the best minds and they were able to have an exchange of ideas amongst the best minds. Okay, so that is the greatest achievement of the Western civilization. So through societies, through publishing their books, right, John, John Locke's books, and yeah, through interaction, so they would go in different countries as well and they would interact with other, other philosophers as well. So John Locke went to Netherlands, he was actually banished. And Montesquieu, he went to England, right, and he studied about Luther and all of these people. So, and then due to the printing press as well, that is why I mentioned printing press, that they were able to spread their ideas much more bit quicker than anywhere else in the world. Like the people are fairly simple and layman. Yeah. These are very complicated exactly. topics, even for uh, like that you yeah. graduates like us, right? So, however, like, why would people accept them? Why would even rulers accept them? They're Christians. This is against more or less against the Bible. How did this happen? In How did enlightenment happen? Uh, 
I mean, like, why would people accept so these ideas? What happened? The and the what people? happened was that the kings pretty much had the sovereign authority. Okay, so the Catholic, the Catholic Church, when it was established, not established, when it gained gained power in Europe, it said that we are going to give you uh, the legitimacy that we are going to say that we are appointed by God and the people cannot rebel against you. But in turn, you have to accept Christianity and you have to accept some of the things that we say. Let's say if we say burn this guy at the stake because he's a heretic, you have to do it. So they said, okay. So this, this thing was established in Europe, this collision with, collusion between the Catholic Church and the kings. And then, of course, over time, it became corrupt. They became, yeah, how, how long can you keep people suppressed? So then it erupted during French Revolution. Revolution. Okay. So Revolution it is, it is erupted during French Revolution and they killed so many bishops, hacked them to death, killed the king, the Louis, King Louis XVI was killed. Okay. Lots of them, I don't know, 50, 60, 70,000 people were killed in French Revolution. And then later Napoleon, when he went back from Egypt, uh, French were threatened by Prussia, which is Germany, and they were also by Austria, if I'm not mistaken. Prussia and Russia. And they fought the wars against Persia and Russia, and they combined Europe, European coalition fought against France because they did not want the revolution to spread across all over Europe. So now Napoleon defeated all of them, and he spread the Enlightenment ideas across all over Europe. Yep. Except the British, he did not. He was not able to defeat them. Why? Why was he not able to accept the British? Did he had a better land army than the British? Yes. The Navy. Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. yes. Army, regarding land army, he said that if the British come to France, I will send the Belgian police to handle with them. Okay. But the Navy, the British Navy was better, and we had English Channel. So we could not cross the English Channel. Yes. 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 Engineering. <laughs> 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 okay, the engineering. Yeah. Where did you pick all this up from? Self service? Yes. Self service. Please object to something that he said. <laughs> 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 we are just lame and listening to him and accepting whatever he says. Brain washing pleasure number one, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, question. Yes. Right. How did Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan? Put the wheeling mode, like whatever the trap he. <laughs> <laughs> what did it? What? Sorry. Like whatever he, his philosophy, how did he put his philosophy in mode? He, he wrote a book in which he interpreted the Quran. I don't remember the name of the book. Look, Sir Sayyid had two sides. Okay. One side was extremely sympathetic to the Muslims. He was very concerned about the Muslims of India, that if they are not going to acquire the Western education, they are going to remain, they are going to be in the lower class, right? So they are going to become butchers, they are going to be mechanics. I don't know mechanics like these things. They are going to be yeah, carpenters and stuff like that. They are not going to be at the upper echelon. So he wanted benefit for the Muslims of entire India. So he had this vision. So, and he was also, let's say, there is one incident that comes to my mind. So there was this oriental by the name of William, William Ward. And he wrote his book, The Life of Muhammad. M O H A M A T. Okay? And in that book, of course, he attacked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was so depressed by that that he was willing to sell his own property in order to write a book which refuted the claims that were made by William Moore. So, he had this one side in, in, in which he was very sympathetic to the Muslims of India. But then again, the reason why I'm doing it is because the uh, the reason why I did it, I did not, did not even mention it. I should have mentioned it. Okay? So, so the reason why we chose this topic was because we have to learn from the past. Okay? We have to learn from the past and we have to recognize the mistakes that we are repeating that we did in the past. Okay? And then we have to prevent the mistakes that were, that were made in the past. And the so the mistakes that were made by learned people like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was that they accepted everything that came from the West without question. So just let me give you one example. Right? I've been talking about science a lot. So, now this unequivocal acceptance of science, everything, technology, everything that is coming from the West will be accepted without scrutinizing it at all. So if you are going to ask a Muslim, oh this this thing is uh, this uh, meta meta meta, 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 me
Exactly, and that the consequences of that is showing now, and like is is really we can feel them. We can everyone, every human being is experiencing that. So therefore, uh, every every human you know is experiencing that, and not even humans, animals and plants as well. And so that you know really kind of like paves the way for for um, yeah. what you just said. Muslims have morality. Yeah. The rest of technology is in the morality. So what Muslims should do is to at least engage with it on equal terms because they have something which others don't have. You also have like the Instagram trending, materialistic, you know, shopping, and what else? Yeah. Depression. Yes. Sorry, uh, I want to go back to his question. What was his question exactly? I don't know. <laughs> I think the answers drifted off his question. Really, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, and we can't portion what we're talking about. Islamic. Like the start of the process. Yeah. 
I think uh, if I did understand the brother's question correctly, like he's saying, inshallah, in the rest of the course, the questions will be answered slowly, hopefully, inshallah. inshallah. But as a glimpse, the confusion is being made between natural sciences and metaphysical sciences. That's the same thing. What we, what is happening to us Muslims is we are overriding our metaphysical sciences with the natural sciences. That's the problem. Accepting the natural sciences is not a problem, but destroying our metaphysical, metaphysical sciences due to natural sciences is the problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's not happening. But is that due to a contradiction between both? No, yeah, that's what we discussed it's today, two right? Different things. <laughs> that's the entire discussion it's today. It's two completely different realms. They, they don't have any connection. Yeah. One is ideology, and one is study and mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And what us Muslims have done is we've taken the natural sciences and, and started adapting it into our ideologies. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you said, I would, yeah, I would disagree. Yeah. Yes. I, I would disagree. As I said, that science is not value free. It does not come with, okay, this is natural sciences, this is the objective reality, that is one thing. Because when you observe a few things, the way you interpret it is based upon certain values. For example, if I'm a scientist, I'm an atheist. I would subscribe to methodological naturalism or philosophical naturalism. Philosophical naturalism means that there is no such thing as supernatural. There is no such thing as God. So the interpretation that I'm going to give is going to be based upon my values. Okay? So let's say if a Muslim person is going to look at uh, nature, he's going to say, SubhanAllah, Allah has created this nature, amazing. And if an atheist is going to say it, if an atheist is going to see it, and scientists majority majority of the times, because of methodolo methodological naturalism, which morphed into philosophical naturalism, yeah. they say randomness. Okay, and they have no problem with that. So this concept of randomness, which can never be proven, never be proven. I challenge anybody in the world to prove randomness. It can never be proven. Okay? But they automatically come to this conclusion instead of God, because because they are subscribing to methodological and philosophical naturalism, which is a part of Western science. So therefore I say that Western science is not very free, which means that, so I'm not saying that we should just uh, abandon science not doing it. Of course not, of course not. What I'm saying is that we should be very strong in our, we should know our values, and then engage with the science at least on equal terms. That is what I'm saying. No one is denying what you're saying. Let me put it in a simple way. Yes, yeah. yes, please. This is not the first time Western and how do you say it? Oriental, for lack of a better word. Mm. Um, civilizations have clashed, right? But like the period we've covered today is a period where like Western domination started, right? And Islamic doubt started more strongly. So for me personally, um, I don't really see how do you say the incoherence between like science as a concept, not science as a value system. What you're talking. And it's not. I don't see that. I, I, it's, it's that simple. Uh, I, I, Basically, it's you are saying the same thing. Science. In a saying the same thing. In a but it's just a different way. Yeah. Science came from the Islamic world. Science. I mean, Hassan ibn al-Haytham is the first scientist. Al-Bayouni was the one who established the scientific method. So, of course, it is not. Uh, the, thing is, the thing is, this is such a complex topic, right? And what we're talking about today is not just philosophy, but also history. Right? There are so many other concepts that come into play. Who knows what if and what like this battle or that battle? Who knows what history could have been, right? Yeah. So this is my my interpretation of how things happen. Mm -hmm. That is what I think I should have made it clear, but I think it's pretty clear. I should be clear. Did you leave the no, but there is, there is I one, not say this <laughs> one, uh, one more thing I want. Uh, you mentioned when you uh, use the word metaphysical and then use the word ideological. Yeah, I don't remember him using, but you yeah. said metaphysical yeah, and naturalist. Yeah, the other brothers. No, no, not you. Uh, but 